This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. Oh, it's fun. fun. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, well, look, I'm a, I'm a pretty competitive person. Yeah. Um, doing sports that basically require your full attention, I think, is really important to my like mental health and and the way I just stay focused at doing everything I'm doing. So like I decided to to get into martial arts and it's um it's awesome. I got like a ton of my friends into it. We all train together. Um we have like a mini academy in my garage. Mm-hmm. Um and I guess um you know one of my friends was like, hey, uh, we should go do a tournament. I was like, okay, yeah, let's do it. I'm not gonna shy away from a challenge like that. So yeah, it was but it was it was awesome. It was it was just a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a hundred percent focus sport. Yeah. To to compete, I, I you know I needed to get around the fact that I didn't want it to be like this this big thing. So I basically just I, I rolled up with a hat mm-hmm. and sunglasses, and I was wearing a COVID mask. Mm-hmm. And I registered under my first and middle name, so Mark Elliott. Mm-hmm. And um and it wasn't until I actually like pulled all that stuff off right before I got on the mat that I think people knew it was me. So it was it was pretty low key. I don't know. I no mean, fear. I, I just think part of learning is failing. Okay. Right. So, I mean, the main thing, like people who who train jujitsu, it's like you need to not have pride because I mean, all the stuff that you were talking about before yeah. about you know getting choked or getting you know a joint lock. It's um, you only get into a bad situation if you're not willing to tap once you you've already lost, right? And but obviously, when you're getting started with something, you're not going to be an expert at it immediately. So you you just need to to be willing to go with that. But I think this is like, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe I've just been embarrassed enough times in my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I I do think that there's a thing where like you know, as people grow up, maybe they don't want to be embarrassed or anything. They've built their adult identity, yeah. and they they kind of have have a sense of of who they they are and and what they want to project. And I don't know. I think maybe to some degree, you know your ability to keep doing interesting things is your willingness to be embarrassed again and Mm -hmm. go back to step one and start as a beginner and get your ass kicked and you know look stupid doing things and you know i think so many of the things that we're doing whether it's whether it's this i mean this is just like a, a kind of a physical part of my life but um but at running the company it's like we we just take on new adventures and um you know, all the big things that we're doing, I think of as like 10 plus year missions that we're on where, you know, often early on, you know, people doubt that we're going to be able to do it. And the initial work seems kind of silly. And our whole ethos is we don't want to wait until something is perfect to put it out there. We want to get it out quickly and get feedback on it. And so I don't know. I mean, there's probably just something about how I approach things in there. But I I just kind of think that the moment that you decide that you're going to be too embarrassed to try something new, then you're not going to learn anything anymore. The thing that stresses me out the most is always is always the people challenges. You know, I, I kind of think that, um, you know, strategy questions, you know, I tend to have enough conviction around the values of what we're trying to do and what I think matters and what I want our company to stand for that those don't really keep me up at night that much. I mean, I, I kind of, you know, it's not that I, I get everything right. Of course I don't, right? I mean, make, we make a lot of mistakes. But um, but I at least have a pretty strong sense of where I want us to go on that. The the thing in in, in running a company for you know, almost twenty years now, one of the things that's been pretty clear is when you have a team that's cohesive, you can get almost anything done, and you know you can you can run through super hard challenges. Um, you can make hard decisions and push really hard to, to do the best work, even, you know, and, and kind of optimize something super well. But when, when there's that tension, I mean, that's, that's when, when things get really tough. And, you know, when I talk to other friends who run other companies and things like that, I think one of the things that I actually spend a disproportionate amount of time on in running this company is just fostering a pretty tight core group of, of people who are running the company, uh, with me. And, that to me is is kind of the thing that both makes it fun, right? Having having 
you know, friends and people you've worked with for a while and new people and new perspectives, but like a pretty tight group who can, who you can go work on some of these crazy things with. Um, but to me, that's also the most stressful thing is, is when, when there are, when there's tension, um, you know, that's, that, that weighs on me. I, I think the, you know, just it's, 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 it's maybe not surprising. I mean, we're like a very people focused company and it's the, the people is the, the part of it that, that, um, you know, weighs on me the most to make sure that we get right. But yeah, that, that, that I'd say across everything that we do is probably the, the big thing. Yeah. I mean, I think for one thing, it's just spending a lot of time with whatever the group is that you want to be that core group grappling with all of the biggest challenges. And that requires a fair amount of openness. And, you know, so, I mean, a lot of how I, I run the company is, you know, it's like every Monday morning we get our, it's about the top 30 people together. And we, and this is a group that just worked together for a long period of time. And I mean, people, people rotate in. I mean, new people join, people leave the company, people go to other roles in the company. So it's, it's not the, the same group over time, but then we spend, you know, a lot of times a couple of hours, a lot of the time it's, you know, it can be somewhat unstructured. We like, I'll come with maybe a few topics that I, that are top of mind for me, but I'll, I'll ask other people to bring things and people, you know, raise questions, whether it's okay, there's an issue happening in some country, um, with, with some policy issue. There's like a new technology that's developing here. We're having an issue with this partner. Um, you know, there's a design trade-off and WhatsApp between two things that, that end up, um, being values that we care about deeply. And we need to kind of decide where we want to be on that. And I just think over time when, um, you know, by working through a lot of issues with people and, and doing it openly, people develop an intuition for each other and a bond and camaraderie. Mm -hmm. Um, and to me, developing that is, is like a lot of the fun part of running a company or doing anything, right? I, I think it's like having, having people who are kind of along on the journey that you're, that you feel like you're doing it with. Nothing is ever just one person doing it. Well, it's like a kimono. It's like kimono. the traditional martial arts or yeah, kimono. Pajamas. Um, pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> that you could choke people with. Yes. Well, it's got the lapels. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I like jujitsu. I also really like MMA. Mm -hmm. And so I think no gi more closely approximates MMA. And I think my style is um is maybe a little closer to an MMA style. So like a lot of jujitsu players are fine being on their back, right? And obviously having a good guard is 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 a critical part of 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 jujitsu, but but in MMA you don't want to be on your back, right? Because even if you have control, you're just taking punches while you're on your back. So um, so that's no good. Do you like being on top? My my style is I'm I'm probably more pressure and um and yeah and and, and I'd I'd probably rather be the top player. But mm -hmm. um but I'm also smaller, right? I'm not I'm not like a, a heavyweight guy, right? So from that perspective, I think like you know it's uh, especially because you know if I'm doing a competition, I'll compete with people who are my size. But you know, a lot of my friends are bigger than me, so. Um, so back takes probably pretty important, right? Because that's where you have the most leverage advantage, right? Where, where, um, you know, people, you know, their arms, your arms are very weak behind you, right? So, um, so being able to get to the back and, and, and take that pr pretty important, but I don't know. I feel like the right strategy is to not be too committed to any single submission. But that said, I don't like hurting people. So, um, so I always think that chokes are, are a somewhat more humane way to go than, right. than joint locks. I just think you have to be willing to um to just get beaten up a lot. Yeah. I mean it's <laughs> but but I mean over yeah. time I think that there's there's a flow to all these things. Yes. I and mean, there's um you know one of the one of I don't know my my experiences that I think kind of transcends you know running a company and the different different activities that I like doing are I I really believe that like if you're going to accomplish whatever anything a lot of it is just being willing to push through, right? And, and having the grit and determination to, to, to push through difficult situations. Um, and I think that for a lot of people that, um, that ends up being sort of a, a difference maker between the people you know, who, who, who kind of get the most done and, and not, I mean, there's all these questions about like, um, you know, how, how many days people want to work and things like that. I think almost all the people who like start successful companies or things like that are just, are working extremely hard. But I think one of the things that you learn both by 
you know, doing this over time or, you know, very acutely with things like jujitsu or, or surfing is um, you can't push through everything. And I think that that's, you, you learn this stuff very acutely run, uh, doing sports compared to running a company because running a company, the cycle times are so long, right? It's like you start a project and then, you know, it's like months later, or, you know, if we're, you're building hardware, it could be years later before you're actually getting feedback and able to, you know, make the next set of decisions for the next version of the thing that you're doing. Whereas you, one of the things that I just think is mentally so nice about these very high turnaround conditioning sports, things like that, is that you, you get feedback very quickly, right? It's like, okay, like I, I don't counter something correctly. You get punched in the face, right? So not in jujitsu, you don't, you don't get punched in jujitsu, but in MMA, mm -hmm. um, there are all these analogies between all these things mm -hmm. that I think actually hold that are that are like I important life lessons, right? It's like, okay, you're surfing a wave. It's like, you know, sometimes you're you, like, you, you can't go in the other direction on it, right? It's like, th there are limits to kind of what, you know, it's like a foil, you can, you can pump the foil and, and push pretty hard in a bunch of directions. But like, yeah, you, you know, it's at some level, like the momentum against you is, is strong enough. You're, that's not going to work. And, and I do think that, um, that's sort of a, a humbling, but also an important lesson for, you know, I think people who are running things or building things, it's like, yeah, you, you, um, you know, a, a lot of the game is just being able to kind of push and, 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 and work through complicated things, but you also need to kind of have enough of an understanding of like which things you you just can't push through and where where um um the finesse is more important i've just i've just failed and been embarrassed so many times yeah. in my life that like you know i'm i'm it's a core competence at this point <laughs> it's a core competence <laughs> yeah sure i think you're right first of all that in the last year, there have been a bunch of advances on scaling up these large transformer models. So there's the language equivalent of it with large language models. Um, there's sort of the image generation equivalent with these large diffusion models. Um, there's a lot of fundamental research that's gone into this. And Meta has taken the approach of being quite open and academic in, in, in our development. Um, of, of AI. Part of this is we want to have the best people in the world researching this. And, um, and a lot of the best people want to know that they're going to be able to share their work. So that's part of the deal that we, that we have is that, you know, we can get, you know, if, if you're one of the top AI researchers in the world, you can come here, you can get access to kind of industry scale, um, infrastructure and, and, and part of our ethos is that we, we want to share what's, what's invented, um, broadly. We do that with a lot of the the different AI tools that we create, and Llama is the language model that that our research team made. And you know, we we did an, a limited um, a limited open source release for it, mm -hmm. right? Where which was intended for researchers to be able to use it, um, but you know, responsibility and, and getting safety right on these is um, is very important. So we didn't think that for the first one there were there were a bunch of questions around whether we should be releasing this commercially. So we kind of punted on that for, for V1 of, of Llama and, and just released it from research. Now, obviously by releasing it for research, um, you know, it's out there, but, but companies know that, that they're, that they're not supposed to kind of put it into commercial releases. And, um, you know, we're, we're working on the follow-up models for this and, and thinking through how, how, um, what, what the, the, how, how exactly this should work for for follow on now that we've had time to to work on a lot more of the the safety and um and the pieces around that but but overall i mean this is i, I just kind of think that that it would be good if there were a lot of different folks who had the ability to build state of the art technology here you know the, it's and, and not just a small number of of big companies where to train one of these AI models, the state of the art models, is um, you know, just takes you know hundreds of millions of dollars of infrastructure, right? So there are not that many organizations in the world um, that can do that at the biggest scale today. And now it, it gets it gets more efficient every day. So um, 
So I, I, I do think that that will be available to more folks over time. But but I just think like there's there's all this innovation out there that people can create, and um, and and I I just think that we'll we'll also learn a lot by by seeing what the whole community of students and um, and hackers and startups and, and different folks um, build with this. And that's kind of, that's kind of been how we've approached this. And it's also how we've done a lot of our infrastructure and we took our whole data center design and our server design, and we, we built this open compute project where we just made that public. And, um, part of the theory was like, all right, if we make it so that more people can use this server design, then, um, then that'll enable more innovation. It'll also make the server design more efficient and that'll, that'll make our business more efficient too. So that's worked. And we've, we've just done this with a lot of our, our infrastructure. No, I think it's been really neat to see. I mean, there's been folks who are getting it to run on local devices, right? So if you're an individual who just, you know, wants to experiment, uh, you know, with this at home, you probably don't have a large budget to get access to like a large amount of cloud compute. So getting it to run on your local laptop, um, you know, is, is, uh, is pretty good, right. And pretty relevant. Um, and then there were things like, yeah, llama CPP, um, re-implemented it more efficiently. So, you know, now, even when we run our own versions of it, um, we can do it on way less compute and it just way more efficient, save a lot of money, um, for everyone who, who uses this. So that, that is, is, is good. Um, I do think it's worth calling out that because this was a relatively early release, um, Llama isn't quite as on the frontier as, for example, the biggest open AI models or the biggest um, Google models, right? I mean, you mentioned that the largest Llama model that we released had 65 billion parameters. And I mean, no one knows, you know, I guess outside of open AI, um, exactly what the specs are for um, for, for GPT-4. But, but I, I think the, you know, my understanding is it's like, 10 times bigger. Um, and I think Google's Palm model is is also, I think, has about 10 times as many parameters. Now, the Llama models are very efficient, so they, they perform well for, for something that's around 65 billion parameters. So for me, that was also part of this because you know, there's this whole debate around, you know, is it good for everyone in the world to have access to, um, to the most frontier AI models? And I, I think as the AI models start approaching something that's like a superhuman intelligence. I think that that's a bigger question that we'll have to grapple with. But right now, I mean, these are still, you know, very basic tools. They're, um, you know, they're they're powerful in the sense that you know a lot of open source software like databases or web servers can enable a lot of pretty important things. Um, but I don't think anyone looks at the the you know the current generation of llama and thinks it's um you know anywhere near a super intelligence so I, I think that a bunch of those questions around like is it is it good to to kind of get out there I, I think at this stage surely you you want more researchers working on it for all the reasons that um that open source software has a lot of advantages and we talked about efficiency before but another one is just open source software tends to be more secure because you have more people looking at it openly and scrutinizing it um and finding holes in it um and that makes it more safe. So I think at this point, it's more, I think it's generally agreed upon that open source software is generally more secure and safer um, than things that are kind of developed in a silo where people try to get through security through obscurity. So I think that for the scale of, of, of what we're seeing now with AI, I think we're more likely to get to, you know, good alignment and good um, understanding of, of, of kind of what needs to do to make this work well by having it be open source. And, and that's something that I think is, is quite good to have out there and, and, and happening publicly at this point. Yeah, I mean, again, I think for the stage that we're at in the development of AI, I don't think anyone looks at the current state of things and thinks that this is super intelligence. Um, and, you know, the models that we're talking about, for the, the llama models here are, you know, generally an order of magnitude smaller than what OpenAI or, or Google are doing. So I, I think that at least for the stage that we're at now, the equities balance strongly, in my view, towards doing this more openly. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think if you got something that was closer to super intelligence, then I think you'd have to discuss that more and, and think through that 
um, a lot more. And we, we haven't made a decision yet as to what we would do if we were in that position. But I don't think I, I think there's a good chance that we're pretty far off from that position. So, um, so I, I'm I'm not uh, I'm certainly not saying that the position that we're taking on this now applies to every single thing that we would ever do. And you know, certainly inside the company, you know, we probably do more open source work than you know most of the other big tech companies. But we also don't open source everything. Right? And a lot of our you know, the core kind of app code for WhatsApp or Instagram or something. I mean, we're we're not open sourcing that. It's not like a a general enough piece of software that would be useful for a lot of people to do different things. Um, you know, whereas the software that we do, whether it's like a an open source server design or um, or basically you know things like Memcache, right? Like a a good you know it was was probably our earliest project. Um, that, that I worked on. It was probably one of the last things that I, that I coded <laughs> and, and, and led directly for the company. Yeah. Um, but, but basically this like caching tool, um, for, for quick David data retrieval. Um, these are things that are just broadly useful across like anything that you want to build. And, and I think that some of the language models now have that feel as well as some of the other things that we're building, like the translation tool that, that you just referenced. <laughs> Yeah, I think being able to translate between all of these different pieces in real time, this has been a kind of common sci-fi idea that we'd all have, you know, whether it's, I don't know, an earbud or glasses or something that can help translate in real time um, between all these different languages. And that's one that I think technology is basically delivering now. So I, I think, yeah, I think that's pretty, pretty exciting. Uh Well, a lot of what we're doing is taking the first version, which was primarily, you know, this research version, and trying to now build a version that has all of the latest state-of-the-art safety precautions built in, um, and and we're um, we're using some more data to train it um, from across our services, but but a lot of the the work that we're doing internally is really just focused on making sure that this is um you know as aligned and responsible as as possible and you know we're building a lot of our own you know we're talking about kind of the open source infrastructure but you know the the main thing that we focus on building here you know a lot of product experiences to help people connect and express themselves so you know we're going to I've I've talked about a bunch of this stuff but um then I mean, you'll have you know, an assistant that you can talk to in WhatsApp. Um, you know, I think I, I think in the future every creator will will have kind of an AI agent that can kind of act on their behalf that their fans can talk to. I, I, I want to get to the point where every small business basically has an AI agent that people can talk to for you know to do commerce and customer support and things like that. So there are going to be all these different things, and Llama or the language model underlying this. Is is basically going to be the engine that powers that. The reason to open source it is that, um, as as we did with um, with the the first version, is that it, uh, you know, basically it, it unlocks a lot of innovation in the ecosystem. Will will make our products better as well, um, and also gives us a lot of valuable feedback on security and safety, which is important for making this good. But yeah, I mean the the, the work that we're doing to advance the infrastructure, it's. Um, it's basically at this point taking it beyond a research project into something which is ready to be kind of core infrastructure, not only for our own products, but um, you know, hopefully for for a lot of other things out there too. This is, I mean, we were talking about the debates that we have internally, and I think, um, I think the question is how to do it, hmm. right? I mean, it's I, I think we. You know, we we did the research license for V1, and and I think the 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 big thing that we're that we're thinking about is is basically like what's the what's the right the right way. So there was a leak that happened. I don't know if you can comment on it for V1. You know, we released it as a research project um, for researchers to be able to use, mm -hmm. but in doing so, we put it out there. So um, you know, we were very clear that anyone who uses the the code and the weights doesn't have a commercial license to put into products and we've we've generally seen people respect that right it's like you don't have you know, any reputable companies that are basically trying to put this into 
into um, their commercial products. But but yeah, but by sharing it with you know so many researchers, it's it's you know it, yeah. it did leave the building. Yeah, well, I mean, I think a lot of the feedback, like I said, is just around you know different things around you know how do you fine tune models to make them more aligned and safer, and you see all the different data recipes that um you know you mentioned a lot of different projects that are based on this i mean there's one at berkeley there's you know it's just like all over and um and people have tried a lot of different things and we've tried a bunch of stuff internally so kind of where we're we're making progress here but also we're able to learn from some of the best ideas in the community and you know, I think it. You know, we want to just continue continue pushing that forward. But so, like, but I, I don't have any news to announce on, oh, on, right. on, on this. Right. If, that, if that's if that's what you're you're asking. Right. I mean, this is a a thing that we're uh, we're still we're still kind of you know actively working through the 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 right way to move forward here. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting idea that I've talked to Jan about a bunch. Um, and you know, we were talking about how do you basically train these models to be as as safe and, and aligned and responsible as possible. And you know, different groups out there who are doing development test different data recipes in fine tuning. But th- this idea that you that you just mentioned is that at the end of the day, instead of having kind of one group fine tune some stuff and then another group, you know produce a different fine tuning recipe and then mm-hmm. us trying to figure out which one we think works best to produce the most aligned model um i i do think that it w- would be nice if you could get to a point where you had a wikipedia style collaborative way for a, a kind of a broader community to um to to fine tune it as well now there's a lot of challenges in that both from an infrastructure and like a community management and product mm-hmm. perspective about how you do that. So I, I haven't worked that out yet. Well, um, just, but but I, as an idea, I think it's it's quite compelling, and I think it it goes well with the ethos of open sourcing the technology. Is also finding a way to have a a kind of community driven, um, a community driven training of it. Um, but I think that there are a lot of questions on this. In, in general, these this these questions around what's the the best way to produce aligned AI models, it's very much a research area. And it's one that I think we will need to make as much progress on as the kind of core intelligence capability of the of the um, the models themselves. A lot of the time. I mean, it's not, it's, it has issues just like any other human system. But yes, I mean, the balance is, I mean, it's a it's amazing what they've been able to achieve, but it's it's also not perfect, and I think that that's um, there's still a lot of challenges. Yeah, and I think that there's also a lot of questions about whether the current architecture for LLMs, as you continue scaling it, what happens. Um, I mean, a lot of the a lot of what's been exciting in the last year. Is that there was there's clearly a qualitative breakthrough where you know with with some of the GPT models um, that OpenAI put out and and that others have been able to do as well, I, I think it reached a kind of level of quality where people are like wow this is this feels different and um, and like it's going to be able to be the foundation for building a lot of awesome products and experiences and value, but I think that the other realization that people have is wow we just made a breakthrough. Mm-hmm. Um, if there are other breakthroughs quickly, then I think that there's the sense that maybe we're we're closer to general intelligence. But I think that that, that idea is predicated on the idea that uh, I think people believe that there's still generally a bunch of additional breakthroughs to make, and that it's um, we just don't know how long it's going to take to get there. And you know, one view that some people have, um, this doesn't tend to be my view as much, is that simply scaling the current LLMs and, you know, getting to higher parameter count models by itself, we'll, we'll get to something that is closer to, um, to, to general intelligence. But, um, I don't know. I, I tend to think that there's probably more, more, um, fundamental steps that need to be taken along the way there. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that there are going to be a lot of amazing products and value that can be created with the current level of technology. Um, to some degree, you know, I'm excited to work on a lot of those products over the next few years. And I think it would just create a tremendous amount of whiplash if the number of breakthroughs keeps like if, if, if there keep on being stacked breakthroughs, because I think to some degree, industry in the world needs some time to kind of build these breakthroughs into the products and experiences that we all use so we can actually benefit from them. Um, but I, I don't know. I think that there's just a, 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 like an awesome amount of stuff to do. I mean, I think about like all of the, I don't know, small businesses or individual entrepreneurs out there who, um, you know, now we're going to be able to, you know, get help coding the things that they need to go build things or designing the things that they need, or, um, we'll be able to, you know, use these models to be able to do customer support for the people that they're, that they're serving, you know, over WhatsApp without having to, you know, it's, it, I, I think that that's, that's just going to be, I, I just think that this is all going to be you know, super exciting. It's going to create better, better experiences for people and just unlock a ton of innovation and value. Yeah, I, th I think there's three main categories of things that we're working on. Um, the first that I, that I think is probably the most interesting is, um, you know, there's this notion of like, you're going to have an assistant or, or an agent who you can talk to. And I think probably the biggest thing that's different about my view of how this plays out from what I see with, um, with OpenAI and Google and others is, you know, everyone else is building like the one singular AI, mm -hmm. right? It's like, okay, you talk to chat GPT or you talk to Bard or you talk to Bing. And my view is that, that there are going to be a lot of different AIs that people are going to want to engage with, just like you want to use, um, you know, a number of different apps for different things. And you have relationships with different people in your life who mm -hmm. fill different emotional roles for you. Um, and I, um, so I, I think that they're going to be, people have a reason that they, that I think you don't just want like a singular AI. And that, that I think is probably the biggest distinction in, in, in terms of how, how I think about this. And a bunch of these things, I, I think you'll, you'll want an assistant. Um, I, I mean, I mentioned a couple of these before, I think like every creator who you interact with will ultimately want some kind of AI that can proxy them and be something that their fans can interact with or that allows them to mm. interact with their fans. Um, this is like the common creator problem is everyone's trying to build a community and engage with people and they want tools to be able to amplify themselves more and be able to do that. Um, but, but you only have 24 hours in a day. So, um, so I think having the ability to basically like bottle up your personality and, um, or, or, you know, like give your fans information about when you're performing a concert or, or, or something like that. I mean, that's, that I think is going to be something that's super valuable, but it's not just that, you know, again, it's not this idea that I think people are going to want just one singular AI. I think you're going to, you know, you're going to want to interact with a lot of different entities. And then I think there's the business version of this too, which we've touched on a couple of times, which is, um, you know, I think every business in the world is going to want basically an AI that, um, that, you know, it's like you have your page on Instagram or Facebook or WhatsApp or whatever, and you want to, you want to point people to an AI that people can interact with, mm -hmm. but you want to know that that AI is only going to sell your products. You don't want it, you know, <laughs> recommending your competitor's stuff, right? Yeah. So, so it's not like there can be like just a, you know, one singular AI that, that can answer all the questions for a person because, you know, that quite like that AI might not actually be aligned with you as a business to, mm -hmm. um, to, to really just do the best job providing support for, for your product. So I think that there's going to be a clear need um, in the market and in people's lives for there to be a bunch of these. It's also enabling, just enabling people to create them really easily for yeah. the, you know, for, to, for your own business, or if you're a creator to, to be able to help you engage with your fans. And I, I think that's, um, so yeah, I, I think that there, there's a clear kind of interesting product direction here that I think is fairly unique from, from what, you know, any, any of the other big companies are, are taking. Um, it also aligns well with this sort of open source approach, because again, we, we sort of believe 
in this more community oriented, uh, more democratic approach to building out the products and technology around this. We don't think that there's going to be the one true thing. We think that there there should be kind of a lot of development. So that part of things I think is going to be really interesting, and we could we could go probably spend a lot of time talking about that and the the kind of implications of um, of that approach being different from what others are taking. Um, but then there's a bunch of other simpler things that I think we're also going to do. Just going back to your your question around how this finds its way into like what what do we build? Um, there are going to be a lot of simpler things around. Um, okay, you you post photos on Instagram and Facebook and you know and WhatsApp and Messenger and like you want the photos to look as good as possible. So like having an AI that you can just like take a photo and then just tell it like okay i want to edit this thing or describe this it's like i think we're we're gonna have tools that are just way better than than what we've historically had on this um and that's more in the image and media generation side than the large language model side but but it's it all kind of you know plays off of advances in in the same space um so there are a lot of tools that i think are just going to get built into every one of our products i think every single thing that we do is going to basically get evolved in, in this direction right it's like in the future if you're advertising on our services, like, do you need to make your own kind of ad creative? It's no, you'll just, you know, you just tell us, okay, I'm, I'm a dog walker and I am you know, willing to walk people's dogs and help me find the right people and like create the ad unit that will perform the best and like give an objective to, to the system. And it just kind of like connects you with the right people. Totally. And do that if, as efficiently as possible. When it's done well, people actually like it. You yeah. know, it's, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of examples where it's not done well and it's annoying. And I think that that's what kind of gives it a bad rap. But, um, but yeah, and a, and a lot of the stuff is possible today. I mean, obviously, A B testing stuff is built into a lot of these frameworks. The thing that's new is having technology that can generate the ideas for mm-hmm. you about what to A B test. So I think that that's exciting. So this will just be across like, everything that we're doing, right? All the metaverse stuff that we're doing, right? It's like, you want to create worlds in the future, you'll just describe them and then it'll create the code for you. So. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the reason why creators will want to do this is because they already have the communities on our services. Right. Yeah. And 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 a lot of the interface for this stuff today are chat type interfaces. And, and between WhatsApp and, and Messenger, I think that those are you know, just great, great ways to to interact with people. I think we'll get to that. Um, you know, and and you know, if only just empirically looking at and Microsoft released this thing called Xiao Ice several years ago in in, in China, and it was a pre LLM chatbot technology that so it was a lot simpler um, than what's possible today. And, and I think it was like tens of millions of people were using this and, and just, you know, really you know, became quite attached and, and, you know, built relationships with it. And I think that there's, um, you know, there's services today like Replica where, you know, people are doing things like that. And um, so I, I think that there's, there's certainly, you know, needs for companionship that people have, you know, older people. Um, uh, and it's, I, I think most people, I don't have as many friends as they would like to have, right? If you look at, um, there's some interesting demographic studies around that, like the average person has the number of close friends that they have is um, fewer today than it was 15 years ago. And I mean, that gets to like, this is like the core thing that mm-hmm. that I think about in terms of you know building services that help connect people. So I think you'll get tools that help people connect with each other are, are going to be you know, the primary thing that we want to do. Um, so you can imagine, you know, AI assistants that, you know, just do a better job of reminding you when it's your friend's birthday and how you could celebrate them, right? It's like right now we have like the little box in the corner of the website that tells you whose birthday it is and stuff like that. But it's, um, but, you know, at some level, you don't want just want to like send everyone a note that's the same note saying happy birthday with, with an emoji, mm-hmm. right? So having something that's more of an, you know, a, a social assistant in that sense and like that can you know update you on what's going on in their life and like how how you can reach out to them effectively 
um, help you be a better friend. I think that that's something that's super powerful too. Um, but yeah, beyond that, um, and there are all these different flavors of kind of personal AIs that I think could exist. So I think an assistant is sort of the the kind of simplest one to wrap your head around, but um, I think a mentor or a life coach, um, you know, someone who can give you advice, um, who's maybe like a bit of a cheerleader who can help pick you up through all the challenges that, that, um, you know, inevitably, you know, we all go through on a daily basis mm -hmm. and that there's probably, you know, some, some role for something like that. And then, you know, all the way you can, you can probably just go through a lot of the, the different type of kind of functional relationships that people have in, in their life. And, you know, I, I would, I would bet that there will be companies out there that take a crack at, at, um, at a lot of these things. So, um, I don't know. I think it's part of the interesting innovation that's going to exist is, is that there, there's certainly a lot, um, like education tutors, mm -hmm. right? It's like, I mean, I just look at, you know, my kids learning to code and, you know, they love it. Um, but you know, it's like they, they get stuck on a question and they have to wait till like, I can help answer it, right? Or, or someone else who, who they know can help, help answer the question in the future. They'll just, there will be like a coding assistant that they have that mm -hmm. is like designed to, you know, be perfect for teaching a five and a seven year old how to code. And, and they'll just be able to ask questions all the time. And, you know, it'll be extremely patient. It's never going to get annoyed at them. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that like, there are all these different kind of relationships or functional relationships that we have in our lives that, um, that are really interesting. And I, I think one of the big questions is like, okay, is this all going to just get bucketed into, you know, one singular AI? I just, I just don't, I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, I think it's mostly good. I, I mean, that that was that question was sort of framed in a negative way. But I mean, we were talking before about language models helping you communicate with, uh, it was like language translation mm -hmm. helping you communicate with people who don't speak your language. I mean, to, at some level, what all this social technology is doing is helping people um, express themselves better to people in, in in situations where they would otherwise have a hard time doing that so mm -hmm. part of it might be okay because you speak a language that i don't know that's a pretty basic one that mm -hmm. you know I don't, I don't think people are going to look at that and say it's sad that do we have the capacity to do that because i should have just learned your language right i mean that's that's a pretty high bar but um but overall i'd say um there are all these impediments and language is an imperfect way for people to express thoughts and ideas. It's, you know, one of the best that we have. We have that, we have art, we have code. More we polite one. <laughs> As, we, we hear this all the time. A lot of creators on our services tell us that one of the most stressful things um, is basically negotiating deals with brands and stuff, like the business side of it. Because yeah. they're like, I mean, they do their thing, right? And and you know, the creators, they're they're excellent at what they do and they just want to connect with their community, but then they get really stressed. You know, they go into their their DMs and yeah. you know, they see some brand wants to do something with them and they don't quite know how to negotiate or how to push back respectfully. And sure. um, so I think building a tool that can actually allow them to do that well is the one simple thing that that I think is just like an interesting thing that that we've heard from a bunch of people that that they'd be interested in. But I'm mean, going back to the broader idea. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I just Priscilla and I just had our, our third daughter. Um, a Congratulations! Couple months ago. Thank by you. The way. <laughs> thanks, thanks. It's and and you know, it's like one of the saddest things in the world is like seeing your baby cry, right? But like, it's like what? Why is that? Right? It's or like. Well, because babies don't generally have much capacity to tell you what they care about otherwise, right? And it's not actually just babies, right? It's, um, you know, my five-year-old daughter cries too because she sometimes has a hard time expressing, you know, what what um, matters to to her. And, and then I was thinking about that and I was like, well, you know, actually a lot of adults get very frustrated too because they can't, they have a hard time expressing mm -hmm. things in a way that, going back to some of the early themes, that maybe is something that, you know, was a mistake or maybe they have pride or something like all these things get in the way. So I don't know. I think that all these different technologies that can help us navigate the social complexity and actually be able to better express our, what we're feeling and thinking, I think that's generally all good. And, um, 
there are all these these concerns like okay are people going to have worse memories because you have google to look things up and and i think in general a generation later you don't look back and lament that i think it's you know just like wow we have so much more capacity to to do so much more now and i, I think that that'll be the case here too oh but that's great and it's also it's not just the the specific coding i mean in the in the context of uh of a large company like this, I think before an engineer can sit down to code, they first need to figure out all of the libraries and dependencies right. that you know tens of thousands of people have written before them. Yep. And um, you know, one of the things that I'm excited about that we're working on is it's not just um, you know tools that help engineers code; it's tools that can help summarize the whole knowledge base and and, and help people be able to navigate all the internal information. I, mean, I think that that's um, I, I, in the experiments that I've done with this stuff, I mean, that's on the public stuff. You you just you know ask ask um one of these models to you know, build you a script that does anything, and it basically already understands what the best libraries are to do that thing and pulls them in automatically. It's I mean I think that's super powerful. That was always I, I, the most annoying part of coding was that you had to spend all this time actually figuring out what the resources were that you were supposed to import before you could actually start building the thing. Well, I think that there's a few different parts of of this. So, one is there are all these harms that we need to basically fight against and prevent, and and that's been you know a lot of our focus over the last you know, five or seven years is basically ramping up very sophisticated AI systems, not generative AI systems, more kind of classical AI systems, to be able to um, you know categorize and. Um, classify and identify. Okay, this this post looks like it's um, promoting terrorism. This one is, you know, like exploiting children. This one is um, looks like it might be trying to incite violence. This one's an intellectual pol- uh, property violation. So there's there's like it's like eighteen different categories of of violating kind of harmful content that we've had to build specific systems to be able to track and. Yeah. Um, I think it's certainly the case that advances in generative AI will test those. Um, but at least so far, it's been the case, and, and I'm optimistic that it will continue to be the case, that we will be able to bring more computing power to bear to have even stronger AIs that can help defend against those things. So um, we've we've had to deal with some adversarial issues before, right? It's I mean, for, for some things like hate speech it's like people aren't generally getting a lot more sophisticated like the average person who let's say you know if it's like someone's saying some kind of racist thing right it's like they're not necessarily getting more sophisticated at being racist right it just it's okay so that the system can just find but then there's other adversaries who actually are very sophisticated like nation states doing things and you know we find and you know, whether it's russia or you know di- just different countries that are basically standing up these networks of um, of bots or, or um, you know, inauthentic accounts is what is what we call them because they're not necessarily bots. That some of them could actually be real people who are kind of masquerading as other as other people, um, but they're acting in a in a coordinated way. And some of that behavior has gotten very sophisticated and it's very adversarial. So they, you know, each iteration, every time we find something and stop them, um, they kind of evolve their behavior. They don't just pack up their bags and go home and say, okay, we're not going to try you know at some point they might decide doing it on meta services is not worth it they'll go do it on someone else if it's easier to do it in another place but um but we have a fair amount of experience dealing with even those kind of adversarial attacks where they just keep on getting better and better and i I do think that as long as we can keep on putting more compute power against it and 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 if we're kind of one of the leaders in developing some of these ai models i'm I'm quite optimistic that we're going to be able to keep on um pushing against the kind of normal categories of harm that you talk about fraud scams spam um ip violations things like that yeah and i think there the question is you have to be i think very specific about what is bad about it right because i think a set of people coming together or organically bouncing ideas off each other and a narrative comes out of that 
is not necessarily a bad thing by itself if it's if it's kind of authentic and organic. Mm -hmm. That's like a lot of what happens and how culture gets created and how art gets created and a lot of good stuff. So that's why we've kind of focused on this sense of coordinated and authentic behavior. So it's like if you have a network of, you know, whether it's bots, some some people masquerading as different accounts, um, but you have kind of someone pulling the strings behind it um, and trying to kind of act as if this is a more organic set of behavior, but really it's not. It's just like one coordinated thing. That seems problematic to me, right? I mean, I don't think people should be able to have coordinated networks and not disclose it as such. Mm -hmm. um, but that again, you know, we've been able to deploy pretty sophisticated AI and you know counterterrorism groups and things like that to be able to identify a fair number of these um, coordinated and authentic networks of of accounts and and take them down. Um, and we continue to do that, and I think we're, we're we've. You know, it's, it's one thing that if you told me 20 years ago, it's like, all right, you're starting this website to help people connect at a college and, you know, in the future, you're going to be, you know, part of your organization is going to be a counterterrorism organization with AI to, to find coordinated and authentic. I would have thought that was pretty wild, but, um, but, but it's, um, is but no, I think that that's, that's part of where we are. But, but look, I, I think that these questions that you're pushing on now, um, this is actually where I'd guess most of the challenge around AI will be for the foreseeable future. I think that there's a lot of debate around things like, is this going to create existential risk to humanity? Mm -hmm. And I think that those are very hard things to disprove one way or another. My, my own intuition is that the point at which we become close to super intelligent is, is, is super intelligence is, um, I, I, it's, it's just really unclear to me that the current technology is going to, going to get there without another set of, of significant advances. But that doesn't mean that there's no danger. I think the danger is basically amplifying the kind of known set of, of harms that people or, or sets of accounts can do. And we just need to make sure that we really focus on, um, on, on, on basically doing that as well as possible. So that, that's, a, that's definitely a big focus for me. Yeah, and that's a lot of the fine tuning and the, the alignment training that we do is basically you know when we when we ship ais across the our products a lot of what we're trying to make sure is that you know if you can't ask it to help you commit a crime right it's um uh so i think training it to kind of understand that and it's not that it's not like any of these systems are ever going to be 100 percent perfect but you know, just making it so that this isn't a an easier way to go about doing something bad than the next best alternative, right? I mean, people still have Google, right? They, you know, you still have search engines, so mm -hmm. um, the, the information is is out there. Um, and you know, for for these, you know, what we see is like for nation states or you know these actors that are trying to pull off these large you know, coordinated and authentic networks to to kind of influence different things. At some point when we would just make it very difficult, they do just, you know, try to use other services instead, right? It's it's just like if you can make it more expensive for um for them to do it on your service, then then kind of people go go elsewhere. And I think that that's that's the bar, right? It's like it's not like, okay, are you ever going to be perfect at finding, you know, every adversary who tries to attack you? It's I mean you, you try to get as close to that as possible, but um, but I think really kind of economically, what you're just trying to do is make it so that it's, it, it's just inefficient for them to, to, to go after that. Yeah. I, I really agree with what you're pushing on. I mean, the, the core, I think the core shape of the problem is that there are some harms that I think everyone agrees are bad, right? So you know, sexual exploitation of children, right? I, like you're not going to get many people who who think that that type of thing should be allowed on any service, right? And that's something that we you know, we face and try to push off the, you know, as as, as much as possible today. Um, you know, terrorism, um, inciting violence, right? It's it, like we went through a bunch of these these types of of harms before. Um, but then I do think that you get to a set of harms where there is more social debate around it. Mm -hmm. um, so misinformation, I think, is um has been a really tricky one because there are things that are 
kind of obviously false, right? That are maybe factual, um, but may not be harmful. Um, so it's like, all right, are you going to censor someone for just being wrong? It's, you know, if, if there's no kind of harm implication of what they're doing, I think that that's, there's, there's a bunch of real kind of issues and challenges there. But then I think that there are other places where it is, um, you know, just take some of the stuff around COVID earlier on in the pandemic where um, there were, you know, real health implications, but there hadn't been time to fully vet a bunch of the scientific assumptions. And, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of the kind of establishment on that, um, you know, kind of waffled on a bunch of facts and, you know, asked for a bunch of things to be censored that in retrospect ended up being, you know, more debatable or, or true. And that stuff is really tough, right? And really undermines trust in, in, in that. And um, so I, I do think that the questions around how to manage that are, are, are very nuanced. The way that I try to think about it is that um, it goes, I, I think it's best to generally boil things down to the harms that people agree on. So when you think about, you know, is, is something misinformation or not? I think often the more salient bit is, is this going to potentially leave, lead to, um, to physical harm for someone um, and, and kind of think about it in that sense. And then beyond that, I think people just have different preferences on how they want things to be flagged for them. I think a, a bunch of people would like, prefer to kind of have a, a flag on something that says, hey, a fact checker thinks that this might be false. Or um, I think Twitter's community notes implementation is quite good mm-hmm. on, on this. Um, but again, it's the same type of thing. It's like just kind of discretionarily adding a flag because it makes the user experience better, Mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not, you know, trying to take down the information or not. I think that you want to reserve the kind of censorship of, of of content to things that are of known categories that, that people generally agree are bad. I think we, it's very difficult to just abstain but but i think we should be clear about which of these things are actual safety concerns and which ones are a matter of preference in terms of how people want information flagged right so we we did recently introduce something that allows people to have fact checking not affect the distribution of 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 um of what shows them their product so okay a bunch of people don't trust who the fact checkers are all right well you can you can turn that off if you want but if the if the if the content you know, violate some policy, like it's inciting violence or something like that, it's still not going to be allowed. So I, I think that you want to honor people's preferences on on that as much as possible. Um, but look, I mean, this is really difficult stuff. I think the it's really hard to know where to draw the line on what is fact and what is opinion, because the nature of science is that nothing is ever 100% known for certain. You can disprove certain things, but you're constantly testing new hypotheses and, um, you know, scrutinizing frameworks that have been long held. And every once in a while, you fr- you throw out something that was working for a very long period of time, and it's very difficult. But, um, but I think that just because it's very hard and just because there are edge cases doesn't mean that you, you know, should not try to give people what they're looking for as well. <laughs> I don't know that there's like a one size fits all answer to that. I mean, I think we basically have the principles around, you know, we want to allow people to express as much as possible, but we have developed clear categories of things that we think are are wrong that we don't want on our services and we build tools to try to moderate those. So then the question is, okay, what do you do when a government says, that they don't want something on on the service, and I think we have we have a bunch of um, principles around how we deal with that. Because on on the one hand, if there's a you know democratically elected government and people around the world just have different values in different places, then you know should we as a you know California based company tell them that something that they have decided is unacceptable actually like that we need to be able to 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 express that i mean i think that that's there's a certain amount of um of hubris in that um but then i think that there are other cases where 
you know, it's it's like a little more autocratic and, you know, you have the dictator leader who's just trying to crack down on dissent and, you know, the people in a country are really um, not aligned with that. Um, and it's not necessarily against their culture, but um, but the, the the person who's, who's leading it is, is just trying to push in a certain direction. Um, these are very complex questions, uh, but I, I think so it's it's difficult to have have a one size fits all um, approach to it. But in what, general, we're we're pretty active in in kind of advocating and pushing back on on um, requests to take things down. Um, but honestly, the thing that I, I think a, a request to censor things is one thing, um, and that's obviously bad. But where we um, draw a much harder line is on requests for access to information, right? Because you know, if you can, if you get told that you can't say something, I mean. That's bad, right? I mean, that that you know is is you know, obviously it violates your sense and, and freedom of expression at some level. But um, but a government getting access to data in a way that seems um, like it would be unlawful in in, in our country yeah. um, exposes people to real physical harm, um, and that's something that in general we take very seriously. And then. So there's that flows through like all of our policies and in a lot of ways, right? It's uh, by the time you're actually like litigating with a government or pushing back on them, that's pretty late in the funnel. I'd say a bunch of this stuff starts a lot higher up in the decision of where do we put data centers. Then um, you know, there are a lot of countries where you know we may have a lot of people using the service in a place. It might be you know good for the service in some ways. Um, good for those people if we could reduce the latency by having a data center nearby them but you know for whatever reason we just feel like hey this government does not have a good track record on on um basically not trying to get access to people's data and at the end of the day i mean if you put a data center in a country and the government wants to get access to people's data then you know they do at the end of the day have the option of having people show up with guns and taking it by force. So I, I think that there's like a lot of decisions that go into like how you architect the systems um, years in advance of, of these actual confrontations that end up being really important. So you put the protection of people's data as a very, very high priority. But in that the, I think is a there are more harms that I think can be associated with that, and and I think that that ends up being a more critical thing to defend against governments. Um, then you know, whereas you know, if another government has a different view of what should be acceptable speech in their country, especially if it's a democratically elected government, and you know, it's then I I, th I think that there's a certain amount of deference that you should have to that. You know, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen it. Um, it's really hard from the outside to know exactly what happened in each of these cases. You know, we've we've obviously been been in a bunch of our own cases where you know where agencies or, or different folks will will just say, "Hey, here's a threat that we're aware of. You should be aware of this too." It's not really pressure as much as it is just. Um, you know, flagging something that that our our security systems should be on on alert about. I, I get how some people could think of it as that, um, but at the end of the day, it's our it's our call on how to on on how to handle that. But I mean, I I just you know in terms of running these services, want to have access to as much information about what people think that adversaries might be trying to do as possible. I guess what I say is there's so much pressure from all sides that mm -hmm. I'm not sure that any specific thing that someone says is really adding that much more to the mix. It's, um, <laughs> I mean, there are obviously a lot of people who think that, um, that we should be censoring more content, or there are a lot of people who think we should be censoring less content. There are, as you say, all kinds of different groups that are involved in these debates, right? So there's the kind of elected officials and politicians themselves. There's the agencies, but but I mean, but there's the the media. Um, there's activist groups. There's um, this is not a U.S. specific thing. There are groups all over the world and 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 kind of all um, in every country that that bring different values. Um, 
so it's it's a, just a very it's a very active debate and i and i understand it right i mean these are you know these these kind of questions get to really some of the most important social debates that 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 are that are being had so um it gets back to the question of truth because it, for a lot of these things they haven't yet been hardened into a single truth and mm-hmm. um society's sort of trying to hash out what um you know what we think right on 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 certain issues maybe in a few hundred years everyone will look back and say hey no it wasn't it obvious that it should have been this but you know no we're we're kind of in the in that meat grinder now and you know and and and, and working through that so um so no the, these are these are all are, are all very complicated and you know some people raise concerns in good faith and just say hey this is something that I want to flag for you to think about Certain people, I, I certainly think, like come at things with a, somewhat of a more kind of punitive or vengeful view of like, I like I want you to do this thing. If you don't, then I'm going to try to make your life difficult and in a lot of other ways. But like, I don't know. There, there's just this is like this is one of the most pressurized debates I think in society. So I, I just think that there are so many people and different forces that are trying to apply pressure from different sides that it's I. I I don't think you can make decisions based on trying to make people happy. I think you just have to yeah. do what you think is the right balance and accept that people are going to be upset no matter where you come out on that. So Yeah, I mean, I, I've probably gotten a somewhat more nuanced view just because I think that there are, you know, I, I come at this, I'm obviously very pro freedom of expression, right? I don't think you build... A service like this that gives people tools to express themselves unless you think that people expressing themselves at scale is a good thing right so i i I didn't get into this to like try to prevent people from from expressing anything i like want to give people tools so they can express as much as possible and then i think it's become clear that there are certain categories of things that we've talked about that i think almost everyone accepts are, are bad and that no one wants and that they're that are illegal even in countries like the u.s where you know you have the the First Amendment that's very protective of, of of enabling speech. It's like you're still not allowed to, you know, do things that are going to immediately incite violence or you know violate people's intellectual property or things like that. So there are those, but then there's also a very active core of just active disagreements in society where some people may think that something is true or false. The other side might think it's the opposite or just unsettled, right? And um, and those are some of the most difficult to 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 kind of handle, like like we've talked about. But um, one of the lessons that I feel like I've learned is that a lot of times, when you can, the best way to handle this stuff more practically is not in terms of answering the question of should this be allowed, but just like what what is the best way to deal with someone being a jerk? Is the person basically just having a, a like repeat behavior of like causing a lot of, a lot of issues. Um, so looking at it more at, at that level. That's true. Absolutely. It's- yeah, no, I think you, and I think you want to be careful about that. I'm not sure I'm expressing this very, very clearly. Um, because I, I certainly agree with your your point there, and my my point isn't that we should not have people on our services that are that are that are being controversial. That's that's certainly not what I mean to say. Um, it's that often I think it's not just looking at a specific example of speech that it's most effective to 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 handle this stuff. Um, and 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 I I think often you don't want to make specific binary decisions of kind of this is allowed or this isn't. I mean, I, I, we talked about, you know, it's fact checking or, or Twitter's community voices thing. I think that that's another good example. It's like, it's not a question of is this allowed or not? It's just a question of adding more context to the mm-hmm. thing. And I think that that's helpful. So in the context of AI, which is is what you were asking about, I think there are lots of ways that an AI can be helpful. You know, it, with with an AI, it's it's less about censorship, right? Because, and it's it's more about what is the most productive answer to a question? Um, you know, there was, there was one case study that I was reviewing with the, the team is someone asked, um, 
can you explain to me how to 3D print a gun? Mm -hmm. And one proposed response is like, no, I can't talk about that. Right. It's like basically just like shut it down immediately. Mm -hmm. Which I think is, is some of what you see. It's like as a large language model, I'm not allowed to talk about, you know, whatever. Um, but there's another response, which is like, hey, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. In a lot of countries, um, including the U.S., 3D printing guns is illegal or, or kind of whatever the factual thing is. And I was like, OK, you know, that's actually a respectful and informative answer. And, you know, I may have not known that specific thing. And um, so there, there are different ways to handle this that I think kind of you can either you can either assume good intent like maybe the person didn't know and i'm just going to help educate them or you could like kind of come at it as like no i need to shut this thing down immediately mm -hmm. right it's like i, I just am not going to talk about this like um and there may be times where you need to do that but i actually think having a somewhat more informative approach where you generally assume good intent from people is probably a better balance to be on as many things as you can be. You're not going to be able to do that for everything. But but I but that you were kind of asking about how I, how I approach this and I'm thinking about this and as it relates to to AI and I think that that's a that's a big difference in in, in kind of how how to handle um, sensitive content across these different modes. <laughs> There is a project. You know, I've always thought that sort of a text-based kind of information utility um, is just a really important thing to society. And for whatever reason, I feel like Twitter has not lived up to what I would have thought its full potential should be. And I think that the current, you know, I think Elon thinks that, right? And that's probably one of the reasons why he bought it. And, um, and... I do think that there are ways to to consider alternative approaches to this. And one that I think is potentially interesting um, is this open and federated approach where you're seeing with Mastodon, I mean, you're, you're seeing that a little bit with Blue Sky. And I, I think that it's possible that something that melds some of those ideas with the graph and identity system that people have already cultivated on Instagram could be a, a kind of very welcome contribution to that space but i don't know we work on a lot of things all the time though too so i, I don't want to get get a, get ahead of myself I and mean, we we have we have projects that explore a lot of different things and this is certainly one that that i think could be interesting but we don't have that yet oh, okay but right. i um all right and and look i mean i don't know exactly how this is gonna turn out i mean what i what i can say is yeah there's there's some people working on this, right? I think that there's something there that that um, that's interesting to explore. Well, I think text is very accessible for people to transmit ideas and to have back and forth exchanges. Um, so, it I think ends up being a good a good format for discussion in in a lot of ways, uniquely good, right? If you look at um, you know, some of the other formats or other networks that have focused on one type of content, like TikTok is obviously huge, right? And, and there are comments on TikTok, but, you know, I think the architecture of the service is very clearly that you have the video is the primary thing and there's, you know, comments after that. Um, and, um, but I think one of the unique pieces of having text-based comments, uh, like content is that, the comments can also be first class. Mm -hmm. And that makes it so that conversations can just filter and, and fork into all these different directions and in a way that's that can be super useful. So I think there's a lot of things that are really awesome about the experience. It just always struck me. I, I always thought that, you know, Twitter should have a billion people using it or whatever the thing is that um that 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 basically ends up being in that space. And for whatever combination of, of reasons, again, it's it's these are these companies are complex organisms and it's very hard to diagnose this stuff from the outside. Well, I just think it's hard to build these companies. So it's um, you know, it's not that every idea automatically goes and gets a billion people. It's just that I think that that idea coupled with good execution should get there. Um, but but I mean look, we hit certain thresholds over time where 
you know, we kind of plateaued early on and it wasn't clear that we were ever going to reach 100 million people on Facebook. And then we got really good at dialing in internationalization and helping the service grow in different countries. And, um, and, and that was like a whole competence that we needed to develop and, um, and helping people basically spread the service to their friends. That was one of the things, once we got very good at that, that was one of the things that made me feel like, Hey, if, if Instagram joined us early on, then I felt like we could help grow that quickly. And same with WhatsApp. And I think that that's sort of been a core competence that we've developed um, and been able to execute on. And others have too, right? I mean, ByteDance obviously have done a very good job with TikTok and and have um, you know reached more than a billion people there. But um, but it's certainly not automatic, right? I think you need you need a certain level of of um, of, of execution to basically get there. And you know, I think for whatever reason. I think Twitter has this great idea and and sort of magic in the service, um, but I, I they they just haven't kind of cracked that piece yet, and I think that that's made it so that you you're seeing all these other things, whether it's Mastodon or um, or or Blue Sky, um, that that I think are you know maybe just different different cuts at the same thing. But you know I think through the last generation of of um, social media overall, one of the interesting experiments that I think should get run at larger scale is what happens if there's somewhat more decentralized control and if it's like a, a, the stack is more open throughout and um i've just been pretty fascinated by that and seeing how that works um to some degree end-to-end -end encryption um on whatsapp and as we bring it to other services provides an element of it because it pushes the service really out to the edges i mean the the server part of this that we run for whatsapp is relatively very thin compared to what we do on Facebook or Instagram. And much more of the complexity is, you know, and how the apps kind of negotiate with each other to pass information in a, in a fully end-to-end -end encrypted way. Um, but I don't know. I think that that's, that is a good, is a good model. I think it puts more power in individuals hands and there are a lot of benefits of it. If you can, if you can make it happen again, this is all like pretty speculative. I, I mean, I, I think that it's, it's, you know, hard from the outside to know, why anything does or doesn't work until you kind of take a run at it. And um, so I, I think it's it's kind of an interesting thing to experiment with, but I don't really know where this one's going to go. Gosh, it's it's always very difficult to offer specific critiques from, from the outside before you get into this, because I think one thing that I've learned is that everyone has opinions on what you should do and like running the company, you see a lot of specific nuances on things that are not apparent externally. And um, I often think that some of the discourse around us would be, could be better if, if there was more kind of space for acknowledging that there's certain things that we're seeing internally that guide what we're doing. But, sure. um, but I don't know. I mean, because since you asked what, what is, what is going well, um, You know, I, I do think that Elon led a push early on to make Twitter a lot leaner. And um and I think that that you know, it's like you can you can agree or disagree with exactly all the tactics and how and how we did that. You know, obviously, you know, every leader has their own style for if they you know, if you need to make dramatic changes for that, how you're gonna execute it. Um but a lot of the specific principles that he pushed on um, around basically trying to make the organization more technical, around um, decreasing the distance between engineers at the company and and him, like fewer layers of management. Um, I think that those were generally good changes. And I'm also, I also think that it was probably good for the industry that he made those changes because my sense is that there were a lot of other people who thought that those were good changes, but who may have been a little shy about doing them. And I think he, um, you know, just in my conversations with other founders um, and how people have reacted to the things that we've done, you know, what I've heard from a lot of folks is, is just, hey, you know, when you, when someone like you, you know, when I, when I wrote the letter outlining the organizational changes that I wanted to make um, back in March and, you know, when people see what Elon is doing, um, I think that that gives, you know, people the ability to think through 
how to shape their organizations in 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 a, in a way that um that that you know hopefully can can be good for the industry and make all these companies more productive over time. So um saying that that was one where I think he was um quite ahead of of a bunch of the the other companies on and 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 you know what he was doing there you know again from the outside very hard to know it's like okay did he did he cut too much did he not cut enough whatever i i don't think it's like my place to opine on that um and and you asked for a for a, a positive framing of the question of, of of what what do i um what do i admire what do i think it went well but i i think that like certainly his actions um led me and i think a lot of other folks in the industry to think about hey are we are we kind of doing this as much as we should like can we is is, like could we make our companies better by pushing on some of these same principles yeah i mean that's it and that's it i mean it's uh and you basically have a significant number of people who you know this is just not the end of their time at meta that they or or i you know would have hoped for when they joined the company um and you know, i mean running a company there people are you know constantly joining and leaving the company for different directions but but l- for different different reasons but um and layoffs are I think, uniquely challenging and tough in that you have a lot of people leaving for reasons that aren't connected to their own performance or you know, the, the the culture not being a fit at that point. It's really just, it's a, it's a kind of strategy decision and sometimes financially required, um, but not, not fully in, in, in our case. I mean, especially on the changes that we made this year, a lot of it was more kind of culturally and strategically driven by this push where I wanted us to become a, a stronger technology company with a more of a focus on building uh, more technical and, and and more of a focus on building higher quality products faster. And I just view the external world is quite volatile right now. And I wanted to make sure that we had a stable position to be able to continue investing in these long-term ambitious projects that we have around, you know, continuing to push AI forward and continuing to push forward all the metaverse work. And in order to do that in light of the you know, pretty big thrash that we had seen over the last 18 months, you know, some of it um, you know, macroeconomic induced, some of it specific, some of it competitively induced, some of it um, just because of bad decisions, right, or things that we got wrong. Um, I don't know, I, d- I just, I decided that we needed to get to a point where we were a lot leaner. And, but look, I mean, but then, okay, it's it's one thing to do that, to like decide that at a high level, then the question is, how do you execute that as compassionately as possible? And there's no good way. Um, there's no perfect way for sure. And it's 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 going to be tough no matter what. But I, you know, as, as a leadership team here, we've certainly spent a lot of time just thinking, okay, given that this is a thing that sucks, like what is the most compassionate way that we can do this? And, um, and that's what we've tried to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to, I want to empower engineers more. The people who are building things, the tech, the technical teams. Um, part of that is making sure that the people who are building things aren't just at like the leaf nodes of the organization. I don't want like you know eight levels of management and then the people actually doing the work. So yeah. we made changes to make it so that you have individual contributor engineers reporting at almost every level up the stack, which I think is important because, you know, you're running a company. One of the big questions is, you know, latency of, of information that you get. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we talked about this a bit earlier in terms of kind of the joy of, 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 and the, the feedback that you get doing something like jujitsu compared to uh, running a long-term project. But I actually think part of the art of running a company is trying to constantly re-engineer it so that your feedback loops get shorter so you can learn faster and part of the way that you do that is by i kind of think that every every layer that you have in the organization um means that information might not need to get reviewed before it it, it goes to you and i think you know making it so that the people doing the work are as close as possible to you as possible is is uh, is, is pretty important so there's that I and mean, i think over time companies just build up very large support functions that are not doing the kind of core technical work and 
those functions are very important, but I think having them in the right proportion is is important. And if um if you you try to do good work but you don't have you know the right you know marketing team or um or the right legal advice, like you're gonna you know make some pretty big blunders. But um but at the same time, if you have you know if if you just like have too big of of, of things and and some of these support roles, then that might make it so that things are just move a lot. Um, and maybe you're too conservative, or, or you you move a lot slower um, uh, than 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 you should otherwise. I just use uh, those are just examples, but it's um, but yeah, how do you find that balance? It's really tough. Yeah, so, no, but that's it's a constant equilibrium that you're that you're searching for. Yeah, how many managers to have? What are the pros and cons of managers? <laughs> well, I mean, I I believe a lot in management. I think there are some people who think that it doesn't matter as much, but look, I mean, we have a lot of younger people at the company for whom this is their first job and you know people need to grow and learn in their career and like that all that stuff is important but here's one mathematical way to look at it um you know at the beginning of this we um i asked our our people team what was the average number of of reports that a manager had and i think it was it was around three maybe three to four but closer to three i was like wow like a, a manager can you know best practices the person can can manage you know seven or eight people Mm -hmm. um but there was a reason why it was closer to three it was because we were growing so quickly right and when you're hiring so many people so quickly then that means that you need managers who have capacity to onboard new people Mm -hmm. um and also if you have a new manager you may not want to have them have seven direct reports immediately because you want them to ramp up but the thing is, going forward, I, I don't want us to actually hire that many people that quickly, right? So I, I actually think we'll just do better work if we have more constraints and we're, um, you know, leaner as an organization. So, in a world where we're not adding so many people as quickly, is it as valuable to have a lot of managers who have extra capacity waiting for new people? No, right? So, um, so now we can we could sort of defragment the organization and get to a place where the average is closer to that seven or eight. Um, and it's it just ends up being a somewhat more kind of compact management structure, which um, you know decreases the latency on on information going up and down the chain, and um, and I think empowers people more. But I mean that's that's an example that I think it doesn't kind of undervalue the importance of management and and the um, kind of the personal growth or coaching that people need in order to do their jobs well. It's just I think realistically we're we're just not going to hire as many people going forward. So I think that you need a different structure. So there, there are lots of different cuts on this question. I mean, I think when an organization is growing quickly, one of the big questions that teams face is, do I hire this person who's in front of me now because they seem good? Or do I hold out to get someone who's even better? Mm-hmm. And the heuristic that I always focused on for myself and my own kind of direct hiring that I, that I, that I think works when you when you recurse it through the organization is that you should only hire someone to be on your team if you would be happy working for them in an mm-hmm. alternate universe yeah. and something that 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 kind of works and you know that's basically how i've tried to build my team it's you know i'm not i'm not in a rush to not be running the company but i think in an alternate universe where one of these other folks was running the company i'd be happy to work for them i feel like i'd learn from them i respect their kind of general judgment um they're they're all very insightful. They have good values, um, and and I think that that gives you some rubric for you can apply that at every layer. And I think if you apply that at every layer in the organization, then you'll have a pretty strong organization. Um, okay, in an organization that's not growing as quickly, the questions might be a little different though. Um, and there, you, know, you asked about young people specifically, like people out of college, and one of the things that we see is it's it's a pretty basic lesson but like we have a much better sense of who the best people are who have interned at the company for a couple of months than by looking at them at at at, at kind of a resume or a short or a short um interview loop i mean obviously the the in person feel that you get from someone probably tells you more than the resume um and you can do some basic skills assessment but a lot of the stuff really just is cultural people thrive in different environments and um and on different teams, even within a specific company. And it's it's like 
the people who come for even a short period of time over a summer mm -hmm. who do a great job here, you know that they're going to be great if they if they came and joined full time. And that's you know one of the reasons why we've invested so much in internship is um is basically it just it's a very useful sorting function both for us and for the people who want to try out the company. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I mean, it's it's a thing that's here to stay. Um but I think that there's there's value in both, right? It's not um you know, I wouldn't want to run a fully remote company yet at least. I think there's an asterisk on that, which is that which is that <laughs> some of the other stuff you're working on, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like all the <laughs> all the um, you know, metaverse work and the the ability to be to feel like you're truly present no matter where you are. I think once you have that all dialed in, then we may, you know, one day reach a point where it, it really just doesn't matter as much where you are physically. Um but I don't know, today it today it still does, right? So yeah, for people who there are all these people who have special skills and want to live in a place where we don't have an office, are are we better off having them at the company? Absolutely. Right. And are a lot of people who work at the company for several years and then, you know, build up the relationships internally um, and kind of have the trust and have a sense of how the company works. Can they go work remotely now if they want and still do it as effectively? And we've done all these studies that show it's like, okay, does that affect their performance? It, it does not. Um, but, you know, for the new folks who are joining um, and for people who are earlier in their career and you know, need to learn how to solve certain problems and need to get ramped up on the culture. Um, you know, when you're working through really complicated problems where you don't just want to sit in the, you don't just want the formal meeting, but you want to be able to like brainstorm when you're walking in the hallway together after the meeting. Um, I don't know. It's like, we, we just haven't replaced the, uh, the, the kind of in-person dynamics there yet with, with, with anything remote yet. So There are basically two big new things that we've added to Quest 3 over Quest 2. The first is high-resolution mixed reality. Um, and the, the basic idea here is that you can think about virtual reality as you have the headset and you know, like all the pixels are virtual and you're basically like immersed in a different world. Mixed reality is where you see the physical world around you and you can place virtual objects in it, whether that's a screen to watch a movie or a projection of your virtual desktop, or you're playing a game where like zombies are coming out through the wall and you need to shoot them. Um, or, you know, we're, you know, we're playing Dungeons and Dragons or some board game and we just have a virtual version of the board in front of us while we're sitting here. Um, all that's possible in mixed reality. And I think that that is going to be the next big capability on top of virtual reality. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about it. I mean, our... I mean, we put a lot of work into making the device both as good as possible and as affordable as possible, because a big part of our mission and ethos here is we 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 want people to be able to connect with each other. We want to reach and we want to serve a lot of people, right? We want to bring this technology to to everyone, right? So we're not just trying to serve like a, you know, an elite, a wealthy crowd. We, we want to... Um, we, we really want this to be accessible. So that that is in a, in a lot of ways a, an extremely hard technical problem because you know we don't just have the ability to put an unlimited amount of hardware in this. We needed to basically deliver something that works really well, but in an, an affordable package. And we started with Quest Pro last year. It was um, it's it's it was fifteen hundred dollars, um, and now we've we've lowered the price to a thousand. But in a lot of ways, the mixed reality in Quest Three is at an even better and more advanced level than what we were able to deliver in Quest Pro. So I'm, I'm really proud of where we are with with um, with Quest 3 on that. It's going to work with all of the virtual reality titles and everything that, that existed there. So people who want to play fully immersive games, social experiences, fitness, all that stuff will, will work. But now you'll also get mixed reality too, um, which I think people really like because it's um, sometimes you want to be super immersed in a game but a lot of the time, especially when you're moving around, if you're active, like you're you're doing some fitness experience, um, you know, let's say you're 
you're like doing boxing or something. It's like you kind of want to be able to see the room around you. So that way you know that like I'm not going to punch a lamp or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if you got to play with this experience, but yeah. I mean, we basically have the, I and mean, it's just sort of like a fun little little demo that we put together. But it's um, it's like you just, you know, you, we're like in a conference room or your living room and you you have um, the guy there and you're boxing him and you're fighting him. And it's like... Yeah, and it, so I think it's a completely new capability that will unlock a lot of different content. And I think it'll also just make the experience more comfortable for a set of people who didn't want to have only fully immersive experiences. I think if you want experiences where you're grounded in, you know, your living room and the physical world around you, now you'll be able to have that too. And I think that that's pretty exciting. Aquarium one where you could see the shark swim up, or, or was oh, that no, just the zombie one? Just where, the zombie yeah. one, but it's still you don't, you don't want you don't necessarily want windows added to your living room where zombies come out of. But, but yes, yeah, so in the context of that it. game, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. I, there will probably be better, more zen ways to do that than the zombie yes. game you're describing. But I, you're right that the the basic idea of of sort of having your physical environment on pass through, but then being able to bring in different elements external i mean it's i I think it's going to be super powerful and in some ways i think that these are mixed reality is also a predecessor to eventually we will get ar glasses that are not kind of the goggles form factor of the current generation of, of of headsets that that people are making um but i think a lot of the experiences that developers are making for mixed reality of basically you just have a kind of a hologram that you're putting in the world will hopefully apply once we once we get the the AR glasses too. Now that's got its own whole set of challenges, and it's um. Well, the headset's already smaller than the, the previous version. Oh yeah, so it's forty percent getting... thinner. And the other thing that I think is good about it, it's yeah. So mixed reality was the first big thing. The second is it's just a great VR headset. It's I mean it's got two x the graphics processing power, forty um, percent sharper screens, forty percent thinner, more comfortable, better strap architecture, all the stuff that. You know, if you liked Quest 2, I think that this is just going to be, you know, it's like all this, all the content that you might have played in Quest 2 is just going to get sharper automatically and, and look better in this. So it's, um, I, I think people are really going to like it. Yeah. So this fall. <laughs> well, I saw the materials um, when they launched. I, I haven't gotten a chance to play with it yet. So, so, so kind of take everything with a grain of salt, but a, a few high level thoughts. I mean, first, um, you know, I, I do think that this is a certain level of validation for the category, right? Where, you know, when we were the primary folks out there before saying, hey, I think that this, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, this is going to be a big part of the next computing platform. Um, I think having Apple come in and share that vision um will make a lot of people who are fans of their products um, really consider that. Um, and then, you know, of course, the the $3,500 price, um, you know, on the one hand, I get it for, with all the stuff that they're trying to pack in there. On the other hand, a lot of people aren't going to find that to be affordable. So I think that there's a chance that, that them coming in actually increases demand um, for the overall space and that Quest 3 is actually the primary beneficiary of that. Because a lot of the people who might say, "Hey, you know, this, I, I like, I'm going to give another consideration to this," or, you know, now I understand maybe what mixed reality is more, and, and Quest Three is the best one on the market that I can that I can afford, um, and it's great. Also, right? It's I, I think that that's um, and you know, in, in our own way, I think we're and there are a lot of features that we have where we're leading on. Um, so I, I think that that's that that I think is going to be a very that could be quite good. Um, and then obviously over time, the companies are just focused on somewhat different things, right? Apple has always, um, you know, I think focused on building really kind of high-end things, whereas our focus has been on, it's it's just, a, we have a more democratic ethos. We want to build things that are accessible to a wider number of people. Um, you know, we've sold tens of millions of Quest devices. Um my understanding, just based on rumors, I don't have any special knowledge on this, is that Apple is building about one million of their 
of their device, right? So just in terms of like what you kind of expect in terms of sales numbers, um, I, I I just think that this is, I mean, Quest is is going to be the primary thing that people in 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 the market will continue using for the foreseeable future. And then obviously over the long term, it's up to the companies to see how how well we each executed the different things that we're doing. But we kind of come at it from different places. We're very focused on social interaction, communication, um, being more active, right? So there's fitness, there's gaming, there are those things. Um, you know, whereas I think a lot of the use cases that you saw in um in in, in Apple's launch material were more around, you know, people sitting um, you know, people looking at screens, um, which are great. I think that you, you will replace your laptop over time with with a with a headset. But, um, but I think in terms of kind of how the different use cases that the companies are going after, um, and they're 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 a bit different for 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 where we are right now. Well, I mean, look, there, there are certain design trade offs in this where, you know, they. I think they made this point about not wanting to have controllers, which on the one hand, there's a certain elegance about just being able to navigate the system with eye gaze and, and hand tracking. And and by the way, you're, you'll be able to just navigate Quest with, with your hands too, if that's what you want. Um, like the, the hand tracking in, in Quest 3 and the, and the really controller nice. tracking is is a big step up from, from the last generation. Um, and one of the demos that we have is basically an MR experience teaching you how to play piano yeah. where it basically highlights the notes that you need to play. And it's like, just all, it's hands, it's no controllers. Mm -hmm. But I think if you care about gaming, having um, a controller allows you to have a more tactile feel mm -hmm. and allows you to capture fine motor movement much more precisely than um, than what you can do with hands without something that you're touching. So... Again, I think it's there. There are certain questions which are just around what use cases are you optimizing for. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think if you want to play games, then I think that that then I think you want you you want to design the system in a different way, and and we're more focused on on kind of social experiences, entertainment experiences. Um, whereas if if what you want is to make sure that the text that you read on a screen is as crisp as possible, then you need to make the the design and cost trade-offs that they made that that lead you to making a, a $3,500 device. So I think that there is a use case for that for sure. But I, I just think that they're they're they've the companies we, we've basically made different design trade-offs to to get to um, the use cases that we're trying to serve. Anytime where there's a number of serious people who are raising a concern that is that existential about something that you're involved with, I think you have to think about it, right? So I, I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about it from that perspective. Um, the thing that, that I, where, where I basically have come out on this for now is I, I do think that there are, over time, I think that we need to think about this even more as we, as we approach something that, you know, could be closer to super intelligence. I just think it's pretty clear to anyone working on these projects today that we're that we're not there. Um, and one of my concerns is that we 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 spent a fair amount of time on this before, but there are more. Um, I don't know if mundane is the right word, but there's like concerns that already exist, mm -hmm. right? About like people using. AI tools to do harmful things of the type that we're already aware, whether, you know, we talked about fraud or scams or, or different things like that. Um, and that's going to be a pretty big set of challenges that the companies working on this are going to need to grapple with, regardless of whether there is an existential concern as well at some point down the road. So I, I do worry that to some degree, you can, people can get a little too focused on on some of the tail risk and then not do as good of a job as we need to on the things that you are can be almost certain are going to come down the pipe as um as as real risks that that that, that kind of manifest themselves in the near term so for me i've i've spent most of my time on that once i i kind of made the realization that 
the size of models that we're talking about now in terms of what we're building are are just quite far from the super intelligence type concerns that um that that people raise but but i think once we get a couple steps closer to that um i know as we do get closer i think that those you know there are going to be some novel um risks and issues about how we make sure that the systems are safe for sure i guess here just to take the conversation in a somewhat different direction i think in some of these debates around safety i think the concepts of intelligence and autonomy or like the 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 being of the thing um you know as an analogy they get kind of conflated together mm-hmm. and i think it very well could be the case that you can make something and scale intelligence quite far but that that may not manifest the safety concerns that people are saying in the sense that i mean just if you if you look at human biology it's like all right we have our neocortexes where all the the thinking happens right and and it's but but it, it's not really calling the shots at the end of the day we have a much more you know primitive old brain structure for which our neocortex which is this powerful machinery is basically just a kind of prediction and reasoning engine mm-hmm. to help it kind of like our our very simple brain um decide how to plan and and do what it needs to do in order to achieve these like very kind of basic impulses and i think that you can think about some of the development of intelligence along the same lines where just like our neocortex doesn't have free will or autonomy um we might develop these wildly intelligent systems that are they're much more intelligent than our neocortex have much more capacity but are you know in the same way that our neocortex is sort of subservient and mm-hmm. is used as a tool by our our kind of simple impulse brain it's um you know i think that it's not out of the question that very intelligent systems that that have the capacity to think will will kind of act as that is sort of an extension of 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 the neocortex doing that so i think my my own view is that where we really need to be careful is on the development of autonomy mm-hmm. and how we think about that because um it's actually the case that relatively simple and unintelligent things that have runaway autonomy and just spread themselves or you know it's like we have a word for that it's a virus right it's i mean like it's can be simple computer code that is not particularly intelligent but just spreads itself and does a lot of harm um you know biologically or computer and um I just think that these are somewhat separable things. And a lot of what I think we need to develop when people talk about safety and responsibility is really the governance on the autonomy that can be given to to systems. And to me if you know if I were, you know, a policymaker as or think about this, I would really want to think about that distinction between these where I think building intelligent systems will be can create a huge advance in terms of people's quality of life and productivity growth in the economy but it's the the autonomy part of this that i think we really need to make progress on how to govern these things responsibly before we build the capacity for them to make a lot of decisions on their own or or give them goals or things like that and i think that that's a research problem but i do think that to some degree these are are somewhat are somewhat separable things <music> a question um i mean look i I think realistically this gets back to the open source things that we talked about before which is i don't think that the world will be best served by any small number of organizations having this without it being something that is more broadly available i think if you look through history it's when there are these sort of like unipolar advances and things that and like power imbalances that they're 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 due into being kind of weird situations so this is one of the reasons why i think open source is 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 generally the right approach and you know i think it's a, it's a categorically different question today when we're not close to super intelligence i think that there's a good chance that even once we get closer to super intelligence 
open sourcing remains the right approach, even though I think at that point it's a somewhat different debate. Um, but I think part of that is that that is, you know, I think one of the best ways to ensure that the system is as secure and safe as possible, because it's not just about a lot of people having access to it. It's the scrutiny that 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 kind of comes with being uh, with building an open source system. I think that this is a pretty widely accepted thing about open source is that um, you, know, you have the code out there so anyone can see the vulnerabilities. Um, anyone can can kind of mess with it in different ways. People can spin off their own projects and, and experiment in a ton of different ways. And the net result of all of that is that the systems just get hardened and get to be a lot safer and more secure. Um, so I think that there's a chance that that ends up being the way that this goes to a pretty good chance and that having this be open both leads to a healthier development of the technology and also leads to a more balanced um distribution of the technology in, in a way that that strike me as good values to aspire to yeah and to, and to be clear I, I feel quite confident in the assessment that open sourcing models now is net positive. I think there's a good argument that in the future it will be too, even as you get closer to super intelligence, but I have not, I'm, I've certainly have not decided on that yet. And I think that it becomes a somewhat more complex set of questions that I think people will have time to debate and will also be informed by what happens between now and then and to make those decisions. We don't have to necessarily just debate that in theory right now. Uh, what year do you think we'll have a super intelligence? I don't know. I mean, that's pure speculation. I think it's, uh, I, I think it's very clear, just taking a step back, that we had a big breakthrough in the last year, yes. right? Where the the LLMs and diffusion models basically reached a a scale where they're able to do some some pretty interesting things. And then I think the question is, what happens from here? And just to paint the two extremes, on the um, on on one side, it's like, okay, well, we just had one breakthrough. If we just have like another breakthrough like that, or maybe two, then we could have something that's truly crazy, right? And and is like is um just like so much more advanced and and on on that side of the argument, it's like, okay, well maybe we're um you know, maybe we're only a couple of big steps away from uh from 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 reaching something that looks more like general intelligence. Okay, that's one that's one side of the argument. And the other side, which is what we've historically seen a lot more, is that a breakthrough leads to, um, you know, in that in that Gartner hype cycle, there's like the hype, and then there's the trough of disillusionment after when like people think that there's a chance that hey, okay, there's a big breakthrough, maybe we're about to get another big breakthrough, and it's like actually you're not about to get another breakthrough. You're maybe you're actually just gonna have to sit with this one for a while, and. Um, and you know it could be it could be five years it could be 10 years it could be 15 years until you figure out the um the kind of the next big thing that needs to get figured out and um but i think that the fact that we just had this breakthrough sort of makes it so that we're at a point of almost a very wide error bars on what happens next yeah um i think the traditional technical view or the, uh, like looking at the industry would suggest that we're not just going to stack in a like breakthrough on top of breakthrough on top of breakthrough like every six months or something right now i think it, it, it will i'm guessing i would guess that it will that it will take somewhat longer in between these but um i don't know well but i tend me- to be pretty optimistic about breakthroughs too so i mean so I, I think if you if you if you normalized for for my normal optimism then then maybe it would be even even slower than what i'm saying but but even within that like i'm, I'm not even opining on the question of how many breakthroughs are required to get to general intelligence because no one knows. Sure. So I I still don't think I have any particular insight on when like a singular AI system that is a general intelligence will get created. But I, I think the one thing that most people in the discourse that I've seen about this haven't really grappled with is that we do seem to have Organiz- organizations and you know structures in the world that exhibit greater than human intelligence already. So you know one example is a you know a company. You know it acts as an entity. It has you know a singular brand. Um, obviously, it's a 
collection of people. But I, I certainly hope that, you know, Meta with tens of thousands of people makes smarter decisions than one person. But I think that that would be pretty bad if it didn't. Um, another example that I think is even more removed from kind of the way we think about like the personification of, of, um, of intelligence, which is often implied in some of these questions, is think about something like the stock market. Right, the the stock market is you know takes inputs. It's a distributed system. It's like the cybernetic organism that you know probably millions of people around the world are basically voting every day by choosing what to invest in. But it's basically this this organism or or structure that is smarter than any individual that we use to allocate capital as efficiently as possible around the world and. I, I do think that this notion that there are already these cybernetic systems that are either melding the intelligence of multiple people together or melding the intelligence of <clears throat> multiple people and technology together to form something which is dramatically more intelligent than any individual on the uh, in the world um is something that seems to exist and that we seem to be able to harness in a productive way for our society is as long as we basically build these structures and balance with each other. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, that, that at least gives me hope that as we advance the technology, and I don't know how long exactly it's going to be, but you asked, when is this going to exist? I think to some degree, we already have many organizations in the world that are smarter than a single human. And, and that seems to be something that is generally productive in advancing humanity. So, I, I think there is a balance in here because I mean, if, if like, you know, if a lot of the input that, that the systems are being trained on is basically coming from feedback from people, then a lot of the development does need to happen in human time, right? It's, it's not like a machine We'll just be able to go learn all the stuff about about how people think about stuff. There's there's a cycle to, to how this needs to work. Yeah, I, I, I was. How I was crazy happy. are you? I it, guess it was is the question I'm asking. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't my best time, but but I um, anything under forty minutes, I'm happy with. Yeah. Um, it wasn't your best time. No, nah, I think I, I think I've done it a little faster before, but not much. I mean, it's um, um, and and of my friends, I I did not win on Memorial Day. One of my friends did it actually several minutes faster than me. Um, but just to clear up one thing that I think was, um, I, I saw a bunch of questions about this on the internet. There, there are multiple ways to do to do the Murph challenge. There's a kind of partitioned mode where you do sets of pull-ups, push-ups, and squats together. And then there's unpartitioned where you do the 100 pull-ups oh, wow. and then the 200 push-ups and then the 300 squats in serial. And obviously if you're you know, if you're doing them unpartitioned, then, you know, it takes longer to get through the hundred pull-ups because you, you know, anytime that you're Exhausted. resting in between the pull-ups, you're yeah. not also doing push-ups and, and squats. So, so yeah, so my, my, I'm sure my unpartitioned time would be, would be quite a bit slower, but, um, but no, I think at the end of this, um, I don't know, first of all, I think it's a good way to honor Memorial Day, yeah. right? It's, um, you know, it's uh, this, um, you know, Lieutenant Murphy basically, this is one of this was one of his favorite exercises and i just try to do it on on memorial day each year and it's a good workout um i got my older daughters to do it with me this time they um my oldest daughter wants a weight vest because she sees me doing it with a weight vest i don't know if a seven-year-old should be using a weight <laughs> vest um, to do pull-ups but yeah but um the difficult question a parent must ask themselves yes i was like maybe i can make you a very lightweight vest yeah. but but i i didn't think it was good for this so she she basically did a quarter murph so she ran a quarter mile and then did you know 25 pull-ups 50 push-ups and and 75 air squats then ran another quarter mile and like in 15 minutes which i was pretty impressed by um and and my my five-year-old too so i so I, I was excited about that and i I'm, I'm glad that i'm teaching them kind of the value of I don't know, physicality, right? I think a, a good day for Max, my daughter, is when she gets to like go to the gym with me and cranks out a bunch of pull-ups. And I, 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 I love that about her. I mean, I think it's, it's like good. She's, you know, um, hopefully I'm teaching her some good lessons, but 
Yeah, so I mean, I've right now I'm focused most of my workouts on on fighting. So so jujitsu and MMA. Um, but I don't know. I mean, maybe if you're a professional, you can do that every day. I can't. I just get you know, it's too many too many bruises and things that you need to recover from. So so I do that you know three to four times a week, and then um, and then the other days um, I just try to do a mix of things like just cardio conditioning strength building mobility um so you try to do something physical every day yeah i try to unless i'm just so tired that i just need to need to relax but then i'll still try to like go for a walk or something i mean even here um i don't know i mean have, have you been on the roof here yet no we'll go on I the heard, roof after I heard this things but it's like I mean, we, we designed this this building and i I put a park on the on yeah. the roof so that way that's like my my meetings when i'm just doing kind of a one-on-one or talking to a couple of people i'm yeah. I, I have a very hard time just sitting. I feel like it, it gets super stiff. It like feels really bad. Um, but I don't know. I, I, being physical is very important to me. I think it's, um, I do not believe, and this gets to the question about AI. I don't think that a being is just a mind. Um, you know, I think we're, we're kind of meant to do things and like physically and, and a lot of the sensations that we feel are, um, are, are connected to that. And I think that that's a lot of what makes you a human is, is basically, you know, having those, having, you know, th- that set of sensations and experiences around that coupled with a mind to reason about them. Um, but I don't know. I, I think it's important for balance to, to kind of get out, challenge yourself in different ways, learn different skills, clear your mind. <laughs> depends on on what the goal is i think that there's this assumption in that question that intelligence intelligence should be kind of person-like whereas you know as we were just talking about um you can have these greater than single human intelligent organisms like the stock market which obviously do not have bodies and do not speak a language right and like you know and and just kind of have their own system um but so i don't know my guess is um there will be limits to what a system that is purely an intelligence can understand about the human condition without having the same not just senses but like our our bodies change as we get older Mm -hmm. right and and we kind of evolve and i think that those very subtle physical changes just drive a lot of social patterns and behavior <laughs> around like when you choose to have kids, right? Like just like all these, you know, that's not even subtle. That's a major one, right? Yeah. But like, um, you know, how you design things around the house. Um, so yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think, I think it would, if the goal is to understand people as much as possible, I think, I think that that's trying to model those sensations is probably somewhat important, but I think that there's a lot of value that can be created by having intelligence, even that that is that is separate from that as a separate thing. Um, I think we'll have the capacity to do something like that. And I think one of the big questions that we've had to struggle with in the context of social networks is who gets to make that. Um, and you know, I mean, my answer to that you know, in the context of the work that we're doing is that that should be your choice, right? I don't think anyone should be able to choose to make a Lex bot that people can can choose to talk to and get to train that. Yeah. And we've, we've kind of, we have this precedent of making some of these calls where, I mean, someone can create a page for a, a Lex fan club, but mm-hmm. you can't create a page and say that you're Lex, Yes. right? Um, so I think that this, similarly, I think, I mean, maybe, you know, someone maybe can make a, should be able to make an AI that's, um, that's a Lex admirer that someone can talk to, but I think it should ultimately be your call whether there is a Lex AI. Yeah, I think that there's a few different parts of this that are relevant. Um, there's sort of a philosophical part and there's a cultural part. I and mean, one of the most basic lessons is uh right at the beginning of genesis right it's like 
God creates the earth and creates people and creates people in God's image. And there's the question of, you know, what does that mean? And all the only context that you have about God at that point in the Old Testament is that he's, God has created things. So I, I always thought that like one of the interesting lessons from that is that there's a virtue in creating things that is like whether it's artistic or whether you're building things that are functionally useful for other people. Um, I think that that by itself is a good. And I, that kind of drives a lot of how I think about morality and my, my personal philosophy around like, what, what is a good life? Right. It's, I, I think it's one where you're you know, helping the people around you and you're, being a kind of positive creative force in the world that is helping to you know bring new things into the world whether they're you know amazing other people kids or um or just leading to the creation of different things that that wouldn't have been possible otherwise and so th- that's a value for me that 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 matters deeply and I, I just, I mean, I just love, you know, spending time with the kids and seeing that they sort of, you know, trying to impart this value to them. And um, yeah, it's like, I mean, nothing makes me happier than like when I come home from work and, you know, I see like my, my daughter's like building Legos on the table or something. It's like, all right, I did that when I was a kid, yeah. right? So many other people are doing this. And like, I hope you don't lose that spirit where when you, you kind of grow up and you want to just continue building different things, no matter what it is. Um, to me, that's a lot of what matters. That's the philosophical piece. I think the cultural piece is just about community and values. And that part of of things, I think, has just become a lot more important to me since I've had kids. Um, You know, it's almost autopilot when you're a kid. You're in the kind of getting imparted to phase of your life. But, and and I I didn't really think about religion that much for a while. Um, You know, I was in college, you know, before I, before I had kids. And then I think having kids has this way of really making you think about what traditions you want to impart and, um, and how you want to celebrate and and like what, what balance you want in your life. And I mean, a bunch of the questions that you've asked and a bunch of the things that we're talking about. A lot of the topics that we've talked about today are around how do you how do you balance, you know, whether it's running a company or, or different responsibilities with this, I don't know, yeah, how, how do you, how do you kind of balance that? And I, I always also just think that it's very grounding to just believe that there is something that is much bigger than you that is guiding things. This is the Lex Free Podcast.